I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Burton Lee. He's the head of medical education and global critical care for the National Institute of Health. And it's really a pleasure to have him here today to speak with us because as a medical student, he made this one of my favorite topics. So to give a little background here, his MD from Harvard Medical School and completed both his internal medicine and palm crate care medicine training at MassGen. He also trained in clinical effectiveness and evidence-based healthcare at the Harvard School of Public Health at Oxford University. He's championed medical education efforts globally, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And overall, he brings an incredible viewpoint with a career focused in medical education, global health, and critical care medicine, including one of my favorite papers about positive pressure ventilation in the CCU that I just recently used. Um, so he's one of my favorite thinkers, and it's an absolute, absolute pleasure to have him talk to us today. Well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Bhavya. Um, so I, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you all. So I, I'm going to just give you one of my sort of introductory talks uh, about evidence-based medicine. And to, and to tell the truth, I think every medical school residency program emphasizes evidence-based medicine. So I don't think this is a new concept, um, but I think sometimes when it's introduced at a too early of a level, uh, it kind of misses the point because people get distracted uh, by things that maybe most medical students think is more important than this, like anatomy or biochemistry. Uh, but, but the reality is, you know, I think most people, uh, even if you're a surgeon, you don't really need that anatomy from first year medical school because you're going to learn a lot more of it in much greater depth as you train and same thing for biochemistry and, and so forth. But I do feel like this topic is something that is broadly applicable to any physician you know, who wants to practice solid, um, high quality medicine. Um, and so I'm going to give this talk and, uh, and you know, uh, if you joined us from the very beginning, you know, uh, we shared a little bit about how this is part of a course material that I teach to medical students and to fellows. Uh, and so it sounds like you know, many of you in the audience are much more sophisticated than that. So, uh, so I apologize, but I'm going to, you know, this is a very basic introductory talk, uh, but I, but I hope it'll still be, uh, you know, it'll still be useful to you and maybe draw some, you know, some discussions about things that you may not have thought about before. So, so one of the, uh, the, uh, the basic, uh, you know, lectures I give as introduction is the, is an introduction to numeracy with a subtitle being uh, Apophenia, Human Nature, and Scientific Evidence. So let me first start with the concept of numeracy, because that word uh, may not be familiar to everybody. And so the word numeracy is actually an incredibly important word for physicians. And it turns out, if I were to go to the UK, uh, I'm told that even somebody in you know, the equivalent of fifth grade, you know, you know, basically primary school, they all know the word numeracy it's because it's used in sort of everyday language, as opposed to even educated people in the U.S., including many physicians, they don't know what the word numeracy is. If you think about it, 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 it should be self-evident and that numeracy is a similar word as literacy. So, uh, so how I usually broach the topic is I'm going to ask you uh, a stupid question to all of you, which is please raise your hand if you are illiterate, okay? Now, I can't see everybody, but the people I, I, you know, I, can, you know, I can see, nobody's raising their hand, and some of you have kind of smiles on your face. And of course, that is an incredibly stupid question, because how could you possibly be a cardiologist or cardiology fellow? You, know, you have to be one of the smartest people in the world to be a cardiologist, so there's no way you would be illiterate and be where you are, okay? But if I switch it around and I say, Raise your hand if you're innumerate. Okay? That's a different question. The word numeracy is the same idea as literacy, except it's not your ability to comprehend and use the English language in our case. It's the similar skill to understand basic mathematical principles. Okay? Now, we're not talking about complex calculus or linear algebra, which I'm sure most of you all took in ninth grade and got eight pluses and, and, and so forth. I'm not about advanced stuff. I'm talking about basic things, okay? The, the ability to read simple statistical concepts, read tables and graphs, and how many physicians are actually able to function in that realm. You'd be shocked that actually the, the research suggests that most of us as physicians are innumerable. Now, I want to be careful 
because I'm, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, so, so don't get offended. Okay, this is a separate skill than your clinical skills in cardiology or critical care or whatever your specialty might be. It's independent of your IQ, and then independent of your USMLE scores and SAT scores. Okay, this is a separate skill set that, for some reason, in the U.S. in particular, I think the education about numeracy is not emphasized as much, or at least not in an effective way. That what research shows is that is that we are most of us are in numerate. So, so um, let's then take a little sidetrack and 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 just go through the concept that you all all know, which is why do we do randomized controlled trials? So, if you want to know if a drug works, let's say this particular drug for a particular disease, we all know that one of the key uh, um, aspects that we do to, to produce high quality evidence is randomization. And then as you also know, there's a purpose for randomization. The reason why it's considered high quality is because randomization produces two equal groups, group A and group B, which are basically comparable in terms of demographics, similar age, similar genders, uh, similar percentage with low ejection fraction, similar, you know, percentage uh, of people with arrhythmias and diabetes and so forth. So you all know that. So we produce, we do a randomized study to produce two equal groups. And then we undergo what's called concealed allocation. That is whether group A gets drug or group A gets placebo is random and how it's assigned or allocated is, is hidden. So no one can control which they get. And then by doing that, then we measure an objective outcome something like mortality, and then obviously if there are few deaths with a drug but a lot of deaths with the placebo, then we can infer that this difference in mortality is most likely due to a drug. So we all know this, okay? So now the problem is, is, is many things can, can go wrong here uh, despite this ideal picture. So I want to focus today on the analysis of the objective outcome side, okay? There are so many examples where numeracy plays when you're analyzing the, the final outcome. So remember I told you that the research suggests that most physicians are in new, right? Well, here's one of those studies. Here's a pretty classic study by Windisch um, um, in JAMA 2007. And what, what, what Windisch and, and their team of uh, investigators did was they took uh, 239 major articles in these major journals, like the New England Journal, JAMA, BMJ, Lancet, and so forth. And they looked at the, all the articles that were published in the first quarter of 2005, so January through March. And they found 239 articles there. What they then did was they cataloged what are the common statistical principles that are used in these 239 articles, and they just made a list. You know, some articles talk about the chi-square. Some articles talk about p-values, obviously. Some articles show the Kaplan-Meier curve, et cetera. Then they made a catalog of the most commonly used statistical concepts. And what they said was, okay, let's go ahead and study how well internal medicine residents know uh, about these very commonly used topics. Okay. Now, again, I want to emphasize, this is not orthopedic surgeons. This is internal medicine, where it's assumed that this is a really an important skill. You know, for you to understand this kind of literature, okay? And these are all internal medicine journals, obviously. Well, I'm giving you a sample. But for example, when they looked at their ability to interpret the meaning of the 95% confidence intervals or the ability to interpret a kaplan meier curve, again, you know, I think you'd agree these are not obscure principles. These are things that are commonly used. We talk about them all the time. Um, interestingly, the, the percent of internal med medicine residents who were able to get this correct was dismal, 12% and 10% respectively. So, I, you know, and so I have this very lame joke, uh, which is that 95% of physicians do not understand the 95% confidence interval. I mean, it's really kind of, you know, disappointing. So, so with that in mind, let's now switch topic to the next obscure term in my lecture. So we, we cover the idea of numeracy that unfortunately research shows that many physicians are enumerate. Let's go to the other word, which is apophenia, okay? So, um, so if you look at the picture on your screen, 
I want you to stare at it for a while. Um, and for sake of time and, and efficiency, I'm not going to have you call it out here in the Zoom format, but I want you to look at it and, t and think about what you see. So, so having given this lecture, you know, like probably about 50 times now in the last couple of years, uh, I, I know what people typically say, which is, you know, the most immediate answers are, I think it's a slice of pizza, or I think it's a piece of toast, or I think it's something like that, some kind of food item. And you're absolutely right. This was a grilled cheese sandwich uh, made by a woman named Diana Duzer. And she was just a, an ordinary hungry woman who made herself lunch on a frying pan. And this is actually a grilled cheese sandwich. And in fact, you can see this mark right here, which is her bite mark. She actually even took a bite out of the sandwich. But at least some of you, if not most of you by this point as I'm talking, you realize there is something else interesting about the sandwich. That is, if you look at the center, there is actually a face that you can see. Does everybody see the face now? Okay. I mean, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you saw it on your own, but a few of you may not have seen it, but now hopefully everybody sees it. In fact, I want you to think about this. Once I point out or somebody points out that there is a face on the sandwich, I, I, I suspect that no one can unsee that. Everybody recognizes it. And the amount of detail is incredible. If you look, I could ask you, is that most likely a man or a woman? Okay. I think there's enough detail to say that looks like a woman. Then you could also ask yourself, well, what about the ethnic background? Is there somebody who's of African, Asian, European background? I think most people would say, well, that person looks like a Caucasian. You know, maybe in her late 20s, early 30s, something like that, maybe even early 40s. Okay. I mean, there's so much detail here. This looks like a, a, a picture um, of, a, of a young uh, woman of European background. Okay. Well, what did Diana Duser do when she saw this face on the sandwich? Well, she thought this could be actually the Virgin Mary. So what do you do with a Virgin Mary when you take a you know, bite out of the sandwich from it? What do you do with it is that you actually put this on eBay and it actually sold as the Virgin Meryl, uh, Mary, uh, a grilled cheese sandwich for $28,000. And I'm told that you can actually visit this in, um, you know, some place in, uh, in, uh, in the U.S. Okay. Now, what this is, is this is apophenia. What is apophenia? I'll give you a little bit more familiar example. When you had more time, especially when you were kids and you had a little, you know, uh, extra time on your hands, we all used to look at the sky and you would see a cloud formation. And I think, again, without any, uh, you know, going back and forth here for sake of time, I think you all can see here, this looks like a galloping horse. You can see the head here, you can see the forelegs, and you can see the hind legs, you can see the tail, okay? And, you know, we've seen things like this hundreds of times in our lives. And, and what's happening here is these are random water cloud uh, or water molecules up in the air, this is randomness, but we as human beings are attributing meaning to randomness. We're seeing a horse when it's a random pattern. Similarly, this is just random burn marks from a frying pan. But we as human beings, it's our natural tendency to attribute meaning to random events and we see a face. Now, what does this have to do with randomized controlled trials? What does this have to do with numeracy? Well, what I'm, what I'm going to show you is that apophenia is one of the biggest threats we have to understanding scientific data. What does that mean? Here are two examples, a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which we will revisit, and another article in JAMA. And I'm showing you 95% confidence intervals, remember? And then kaplan Maya curves things that we're actually quite bad at interpreting. And these have been interpreted with certain significance from the publication, and it's been adopted and, and, uh, and restated in the medical literature, including clinical guidelines, when in fact, it's nothing more than apophenia. So we're not talking about some obscure journals from obscure scientists. These are New England Journal, JAMA, that level of evidence 
It's actually nothing more than apophenia. Okay? And yet physicians still think this is what the truth says. Okay? Now, you're not going to believe me probably at this point because I haven't really gone to depth, but that's sort of the goal is, 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 is what does apophenia uh, 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 you know, do and how does it appear in the literature and how does it impact our understanding? Okay. All right. So, so let me give you an example. Here's another article. This is a New England Journal of Medicine. And this is a pretty classic example of, of apophenia. So here's a paper by Wenzel. And let me orient you to this paper. because This study is kind of old now. It's 2004. But this is a study comparing a, a drug that you all know called vasopressin and another drug that you know, you know uh, also uh, called epinephrine. And this is a randomized study comparing these two drugs in the setting of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, okay? So, um, so the exact, you know, uh, medical question or the clinical question is not that important. However, I want you to look at this and look, and look at the findings here. You can see the p-values are here. You can see the percentages of, um, of outcomes, like, for example, uh, you know, data on the outcome on the cerebral performance at the time of hospital discharge, for example, here's 9.9% and so forth. So I want you to think about what would a typical physician who may be prone to apophenia think about this paper, okay? So look at the p-values here. And I'll just give you maybe 30 seconds for you to look at it on your own. And if you like, I'd like you to also think about what should a more numerous physician conclude, okay? And how does it differ from what a typical physician might conclude? Okay. So I'll show you what the New England Journal concluded. So this was a conclusion. They said the vasopressin and epinephrine, so effective vasopressin were similar to those of epinephrine in the management of ventricular fibrillation and pulseless electrical activity. Okay. So let's look at that. Here's ventricular fibrillation. It looks like all the p-values are not significant. Then they, they look at the pulses electrical activity, and also the p-values are not significant. Um, and they sort of skipped in the conclusion, but in all patients, again, p-values are not significant. But they said vasopressin was superior to epinephrine in patients with a system. And they're looking at probably here where the p-values are 0.02 and 0.04. Okay? So this is what the authors and the reviewers and the editors of New England Journal concluded. Okay. Now let's think about what, you know, what is wrong with that when the p-values are low. So to, to illustrate what is wrong with it, and, and I know that many of you already know this, but, but, but it's kind of, you know, like bring everybody on the same page. I'm going to take you through some extremely silly examples. Okay. So just bear with me, uh, even the examples are silly. And the example is that we're going to gamble with one. Okay. So, and the gamble is incredibly simple. Here is a 20-sided dice, as you can see here. And we're going to bet $100 on this bet. And the bet is, uh, if you agree and you roll this dice, if you happen to roll the 20, you lose. Okay? Otherwise, you win. So the obvious question is, what is the probability of you winning? Well, hopefully, you know, this is not a difficult problem. Since there's 20 possible sides, and only way you lose is if you roll a 20. Everything else, 1 through 19, you win. So probability of winning should be 19 possibilities out of 20 or 95%. So hopefully that's pretty apparent to everyone. And then if you look at probability of losing, then it's, then it's of course, 5% because it's, it's, that, it's that 20 here, this one, or one possibility out of 20. So that's 5%. And I'm, of course, using a 20-sided dice to illustrate the example of p-value of 0.05, which is 5%. Okay? All right. So then, who is most likely to win? You, who's going to gamble? Or me, who's, you know, uh, asking you to um, um, bet with me? Okay? Well, like we said, your chance of winning should be 95%. My chance of winning is only 5%. By far, you're going to win. So, so if I ask you to commit to this, uh, I suspect all of you would realize this is, this is to your advantage and you're going to win and you will most likely raise your hand and say, I'm in this bet. Okay. 
So let's continue this silly example and saying, okay, you all agree, okay? And I'm going to be a very, very rich man very soon because what if I showed you the results in this way? And I said, okay, now that you saw the rolls, how many of you see a 20? Well, I mean, obviously there's a 20 right there. Okay. Now, how many of you would then say, oh, well, it looks like I lost. And you're going to start, you know, you know, send me $100 through uh, my Venmo account, right? How many of you are going to do that? Well, nobody, because you all say, well, that, wait a minute. That wasn't the bet, right? Because what was the assumption? The obvious assumption was you thought I meant one roll, right? But of course, that's not what I did. And, and if you're having trouble with that, it's the exact same concept as if I were to take a 20-sided pistol, put one bullet in it, spin the barrel, and then point it, let's say, to Amit. Sorry, Amit. Okay? And, and then if I were to pull the trigger, his chance of dying is only 5%. That's not a bad chance. I mean, that's pretty good. Okay? So he might even say that, but then ask him, does he care if I pull once or if I keep doing it 10 times? Then you'll quickly realize eventually that gun's going to go off, right? So, you know, this is, a, you know, this is obviously a silly example, but think about that. And so, as you know, this is called a multiple testing, okay? And that is clearly a major problem because if you allow multiple p-values to be tested, you are committing multiple testing. And what that does is that p-value that you think is 0.05 approaches 100% very quickly. Okay? I think we all learned this principle many times over during our statistics, cor uh, statistics courses. But if you look here, essentially, they roll the dice 12 times. Okay? So in other words, this looks like a significant finding, this 0 0.02, 0 0.04 but it most likely represents just randomness. In other words, apophenia. So again, here's a conclusion. Vasopressin was superior to epinephrine in patients with asystole. Now, if this is truly uh, uh, apophenia, you would hope that learned um, editors and reviewers would recognize that. So here is Dr. McIntyre, nothing personal against him. I don't actually know him. But it's a cardiologist at the Brigham, okay? He's a, he, he's a professor at, at Harvard Medical School. And then this is what he writes in, you know, back in this time. He says, because of the size and power of the study by Wenzel et al., saying this is an impressive study, the practitioners, practitioners should perhaps be encouraged to incorporate the use of base oppression into the resuscitation protocols immediately, right? And then suggest that have the appropriate committees of the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology convene in order to issue an interim guideline incorporating these important new therapeutic advances. Okay, so it gets published, and, and then do you think the uh, American Heart Association and so forth changed their guidelines? Unfortunately, they did. You know, so so you may recall, maybe you're maybe you're all too young, but but they actually adopted this for a number of years. But my point is, if this is really apophenia, what should happen if they try to replicate this finding? Okay, well, they did. Just four years later, they, they, they compared epinephrine with vasopressin, including in the, in, in the group uh, with asystole, okay? And they were not able to replicate that finding because it, this was nothing more than a $28,000 cheese sandwich. So what I'm telling you is that the New England Journal of Medicine, if you're not careful, if you're innumerate, they're going to sell you $28,000 cheese sandwiches, and some of you are going to buy this. So let me take you to another gamble uh, to further illustrate the concept of apophenia. Okay? So let's say you're all now a bit more numerate, and you're all on board. And you realize that, you know, I can be a little tricky now. So now you're going to really make me, uh, uh, you know, uh, accountable to uh, um, what I'm going to do. So we're going to do the exact same gamble, exact same $100, exact same 20-sided dice. 
But now that you're more numerate, you're going to insist, okay, only one role. Okay. In the clinical example, now you're going to tell me because I only get one p value, you're going to insist that I have one primary outcome. Okay. Not 12, not 15. Okay. One role. So, okay, I'm going to do what you say. So I agree to one role. Okay. And then here it is. The results are 19. So who clearly won here? It looks like I lost because the bet was 20 and I, and I agreed to one role. Now, I told you this is a silly example, but, but let me, let me, let me make, make a silly argument now to say, what if I tell you, well, isn't 19 fairly close to 20, right? It is kind of close. It's almost significant, right? Or I could say, you know, the probability of getting a 19 is also 5%, which is true, right? But the point is, should I be allowed to change the outcome after the results are known? I mean, that's a ridiculous question for a bet. None of you would, would voluntarily give me the $100 if you knew that I'm allowed to change the outcome of interest after the bet, right? That's ridiculous. No, none of you would do that. But does this happen in studies? And that is what is concerning, right? So here's a pretty classic study uh, by um, uh, Mathal. And, 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 and what, what, what these investigators do in, in this JAMA article in 2009 is that they take all of the randomized controlled trials in high impact journals. Again, this is not some obscure journal. This is New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Lancet, et cetera. They were published in 2008, all the RCTs. And they want to know how many of them had their primary outcome declared upfront. Now, this is after the rules went into effect that says you should register everything in clinicaltrials.gov or some similar body. All the editors have already read. So now they want to know, are, are people following? Okay. Well, it turns out out of the 323 RCTs, only 147 or less than half had registered their primary outcome like they said they're going to. Okay. And it's slightly, and then it's even more concerning than just that. Okay. Of the 147 that did register, 31% of them changed their outcome anyway. And then why did they change it? Well, at least 83% of the time they changed it because it favored their, you know, you know, their purposes, basically. So all in all, if you take all 323 RCTs, it turns out only 33% or a third had actually preserved the alpha error at 5%. So as you know, this is a very important thing to look at. So when I encourage students or fellows that I teach to look at journal club articles, for example, we encourage you to, to check this, but that itself is not the problem nowadays because now people do emphasize that, is you should check it and look at history of changes. Okay? In the past, they used to register blank pieces of paper. That is, they had a number, they technically registered, but they didn't register the primary outcome. Okay. That's getting more and more difficult to do, but it's still happening. There are non-inferiority trials that are published in JAMA. If you look at uh, clinicaltrials.gov, it was not a non-inferiority trial when they started. So there's an updated study that looking at the exact same question and the police percentages are not substantially different. It's still a major problem even now. Okay, so let me take you to a final gamble, okay? Uh, now you should be wiser that there are many pitfalls here in this simple gamble. So now at being even more numerate, you're gonna insist that I have one role and that I'm going to pre-register this outcome so that I'm not allowed to change it to something after the fact, okay? So the clinical equivalent is, again, I'm going to have one primary outcome, and then I'm going to clearly put that on the website. I'm 
on, on clinicaltrials.gov so that everybody knows what it is and, and you can hold me accountable. Okay. So the bet is one roll and I'm going to register that 20 on clinicaltrials.gov when we bet. Okay. So now um, you should feel more assured, right? That, okay, it looks like this is a fair bet. And so now here's my third gamble and here's the outcome. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that it looks like you lost again. There's a 20. Okay. So now, now I expect my Venmo account to start digging here. I expect to be very wealthy. And the problem here now is what? What do you guys notice that's funny about what I'm doing? Well, one of the issues is previously I had shown you a bigger field because what I'm showing you now is this. This is what I had done. I rolled the dice five times, okay? But I'm only showing you the one outcome that I want you to see. So what is this called? Well, it's basically fraud, but the academic term, as you know, is called publication bias, okay? Which is a much more polite term. But think about what that means. If you allow publication bias, bias like this to occur, what is the chance that you would actually win this bet? It's essentially zero, because I'm only going to show you the favorable results to me. Okay? And, the, and the obvious question then is, does this happen in the medical literature? Well, the most famous example of this is actually Oseltamivir. And, and uh, I think you all know this as what? As a medication that we use for influenza, right? This is Tamiflu, okay? So if you didn't know before, okay, it turns out that there were 20 randomized controlled trials on Oseltamivir. But guess how many they published? They published two. And why do you think those two were published? It wasn't because they were the highest quality. It wasn't because they were the largest. In fact, the largest trials that ever got published, it was two that happened to be positive out of 20. And by the way, guess who did all 20 trials? Um, it was done by Roche, who makes, you guessed it, uh, was Sultanovic. Okay. So when the Cochrane group tried to do a systematic review, uh, they realized there were 18 other trials that were done that that they weren't giving them the data, okay? And when they finally did, they realized that it had, on the average, shortened the duration of symptoms by about half a day without affecting any other meaningful outcomes like mortality, hospitalizations, and so forth, okay? Now, if you look at this, um, Lay journals or lay magazines, not medical journals, have written extensively about this. So here's an article in, in the Atlantic saying the truth about Tamiflu has the U.S. wasted $1.5 billion on an ineffective drug. Here's the BBC news uh, actually quoting a professor from Oxford uh, who was saying, I think the whole 500 million pounds, and this is for the U.K., has not benefited human health in any way, and we may have harmed people. And, and at least in my experience, it's hard for me to find a physician who's even aware of this data for Tamiflu. Okay. Now, let me finish with this final example. Okay. Um, this is um, uh, the, uh, uh, this is like during uh, rounds um, um, where you have a patient on, um, norepinephrine. Um, and here's a study comparing dopamine versus norepinephrine. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this particular study. This is a study by DeBacker. Okay? And here is the main outcome here. Okay? Here is the 95% confidence intervals uh, of a hazard ratio with 1.0 being no effect. Here is norepinephrine better, dopamine better. And you can see here all patients, septic shock patients, cardiogenic shock patients, hypervolume shock patients, okay? So you guys are mostly cardiologists, so you guys are probably, you know, know this fact, uh, you know, know this study very well. But here's, here's the data for cardiogenic shock. 
where this 95% confidence interval does not seem to touch 1.0, favoring norepinephrine. Okay. So what is the conclusion that you would draw from this particular forest bond? Okay, again, and then just give you 30 seconds to kind of make a commitment in your mind as to what you would say about this before we proceed. Okay. So, um, so, um, so I'm going to come back to uh, what's written here, but, but before you make a, make a firm conclusion, what you should think about is how do you interpret data like this when you have all patients, and then you have particular subgroups here of hypovolemic cardiogenic and septic shock. And again, these are things that I think many of you already know, but, but, but to bring everybody on the same page, let's go over this article by Wallach, which actually gives you criteria for how to think about this. So their objective was how often do sub group claims reported in RCTs um, are actually supported by their own evidence, okay? So what they looked at was uh, a whole bunch of RCTs uh, and subsequent meta-analyses, and this is what they find. They find that a minority of subgroup claims made in the abstract of RCTs are supported by their own data, okay? 39%, in fact. So most of the time, when the study makes a claim like that, their own data does not support it. Then they also find that most of them fail to meet the best practices for subgroup analysis, including the idea of pre-specification, stratified randomization, and adjustment for multiple testing, a concept we already talked about. In fact, these are the percentages. 28% of the time for the subgroups pre-specified, 35% of the time you know, did they perform stratified randomization? And only 2% of the time did they adjust for multiple testing when they're making, making a claim, okay? And going back to this, the most important thing I want to point out is this idea of, a, of, of, of being supported by their own data, which is, which is this idea of significant interaction effect, a test of interaction, also called test of heterogeneity. The bottom line is, since subgroup claims are so poorly done, when they looked at five times when a subgroup gets retested with a better trial later, in none of the cases were they able to replicate the findings. Okay, zero out of five. So let's walk through this test of interaction one step at a time to make sure we're all on the same page. So here is a study. This is a hypothetical study, but I'll give you some real ones in, in a second. So here's study one, where the overall effect shows that the treatment is better than placebo. Okay? So here's control, here's treatment, here's null effect. Overall, as a whole population, p-value is less than 0, 0.0. It looks like drug works. In fact, the average value is given right here. This is the point estimate of 0.75. Then what they do is they break it down into subgroups of men and women, okay, a, a common subgroup analysis. And as you can see, the men here don't touch 1.0. Women do touch 1.0. And then again, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment of how you would interpret that. Okay. Most physicians would say it looks like it works for men, but does not seem to be effective for women. But that is, again, apophenia. Why is that apophenia? It's apophenia because this p-value for treatment is not what you want to focus on. What you want to focus on is p-value for heterogeneity, also called p-value for interaction. So as you know, p-values, you know, kind of in a big overall sense, is saying, are the two groups similar or different? So this p-value for the overall effect, p-value being less than 0 0.05, says overall treatment is different from control. P-value for heterogeneity is asking, are men behaving differently than women in regard to this particular drug and this particular disease? And the answer is no. Men and women are behaving the same. So the conclusion here would be twofold. One, 
that overall the drug seems to work and there's no difference between men and women as far as this drug goes. Okay. Let me give you another example. Same idea. Treatment is better. P value is in 0.05. Here's the point estimate right here. Men versus women here. Again, a inhumor physician would say for men, this drug works for women. It does not. But now as a more numeric position, you would look at p-value for heterogeneity or p-value for interaction and says, look, it's 0 0.20. The men and women seem to behave similarly. So again, the conclusion would be the drug works overall and it works for men and women. There's no big difference between men and women as far as you can tell. Final example here, same thing. Overall, this drug works. This is the point estimate right here. Men are over here, women are over here. This time, the p-value for heterogeneity is 0.01. It does appear that maybe statistically speaking, men are behaving differently than women as far as this particular drug and for this particular disease. So this is the only condition among the three where there might be some validity to men behaving differently. Okay? Said it differently, these two are common examples of $28,000 cheese sandwiches. But this is the one where you should say, hmm, I wonder if this is true, and ideally retest that in a new trial. And if you can replicate it, this may be a valid finding. But more often than not, if you were to retest this, these are going to turn out to be nothing. Okay? So now let's go back to the Debacker article that I showed you. Okay? Oh, actually, before I do that, um, most high quality studies should give you this p value 0 0.01, 0 0.20, these p value for heterogeneity or same thing p value for interaction. Okay. But if they don't, there's actually a fairly simple example. And I don't think it's, I don't think I put it in here, so I'll just draw it for you. Is all you have to do is draw the line of point estimate, like here. And if you notice, this line, this vertical line, touches both of these subgroups. So even without this quantitative example, I can tell you that men and women are basically statistically similar. Same thing here. This vertical line goes through both. So just a quick and dirty test, and you can impress your friends at, at cocktail parties with a quick look and say, look at that. I don't think these are different. In contrast, look at, um, right? Um, look at this other one here. This one does not go through both. This is the one that even without this p-value of 0 0.01, you would suspect I better do a formal statistical testing. Okay? Very quick and dirty way. All right? So now I want you to look at the, the backer paper. Again, okay? So here, here's all patients and okay? quick and dirty at the cocktail party example. Okay? It goes through all three. I can tell you without any quantitative analysis, it is unlikely that cardiogenic shock is different from hypovolemic shock or septic shock. Okay? If you don't believe me, here is in their own data down here. Oops. Why do you think my mouse is not working? So over here, okay, p value for 0 0.87. Does everybody see that? Okay. Yeah, there we go. P value for an action. What this is saying is if, if these three subgroups were not statistically different, that's a null hypothesis, they were all the same, then the chance of it looking like this is 87%. It's quite likely you're going to find this kind of a variation. Okay. In other words, it is not valid to say, based on this paper, that cardiogenic shock is better with more epinephrine. This is very different from how the studies are interpreted, even what the guidelines say. Okay. Let me close this out. So again, New England Journal is selling us another $28,000 cheese sandwich. See, I have to close this out. Sorry, I have to erase all this stuff. Okay. Okay. So let me finish with this example here. So this is... A, another article for uh, 
this time in Lancet, looking at the role of uh, bicarbonate infusions in patients who are critically ill. Okay. So overall, they find that sodium bicarbonate had no effect on the primary composite outcome. Okay. So let's look at that. Here's composite outcome, all patients. Okay. Down here. And as you can see, the confidence interval overlaps with zero. And so it looks like that that's a pretty reasonable conclusion that based on their data, there is no, there's no evidence that bicarbonate or, or the control is any different, statistically speaking. But then they go on to say, however, sodium bicarbonate decreased the primary composite outcome uh, and day 28 mortality in a priority defined strata of patients with acute kidney injury. So tell me if you agree. So what they're talking about is here, okay? This is the acute um, acute kidney injury here, okay? So um, so they're talking about those with more severe, uh, you know, um, um, uh, it can score two, three. And again, you see this confidence interval does not touch zero. And then now that you are familiar with all these concepts, your mind should be going uh, to this example of p-value for heterogeneity, right? And you notice the p-value is 0 0.0226. See that? So it looks like, hey, maybe they're finally right. Maybe the Lancet has got this correct as opposed to uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay? But then remember I told you that there's a quick and dirty way, which is if you draw a line, if this is really the case, these should not overlap so much. Okay. In fact, look at look at uh, look at this one for age. Look at a p value of zero point zero zero three one. But does it really look like these are that different? Right? To me, they look very similar. <laughs> okay. So then, if you plug in these numbers, I'm talking about these numbers, these wrong numbers. Okay. And you run a p value for heterogeneity in your own software, it turns out these are all errors. This is 0 0.81, not 0 0.21. This is not 0 0.03, uh, 0031, it's 0 0.89, which is what this looks like. And this is not 0 0.0226, but it's actually 0. .1. Okay. So if you look at the raw numbers and you recheck it, don't be surprised if the simple things like p-values might be different from what's published. But as you can see by the rough and, and dirty rule here, there is no difference based on kidney injury score. So now the Lancet is selling $28,000 each sentence. This, so this is the final slide, and I think Bavia will remember this example well, I think. But, but I always conclude this lecture with this slide. And I want you to take a look and tell me what you think you see here. And I get answers like, well, maybe this is time for the Bible or some, some, some ancient civilization, et cetera, et cetera. And then most people recognize that this is actually a painting of the, of the ancient Athens. So this is a famous painting by Raphael. It, uh, I think, hangs somewhere in, in Rome. And, the, and of all the people there, the central figures here, the person on the left is Plato, and the person on the right who's younger is Aristotle. And this is a picture of the ancient academy at Athens. And this is a modern, uh, and this is ancient equivalent of the modern university, right? So these are essentially professors, and these are the students or the, or the disciples, and they gather from all over, you know, all over that part of the world to learn at the school. And the reason why I'm showing you this painting is because there hung a sign on the entryway to this ancient university that I think should hang at every single medical school today. And if you don't know what that sign said, the sign said that no one ignorant of mathematics enter here. And I think if we had such a sign, or at least a sign that says, let no one graduate from our 
medical school or residency or fellowship without being numerate, I think we would all be making a lot better decisions and have a lot better evidence of the scientific evidence. Thank you.